good turnaround Tuesday face. How's everyone doing today? So King Dollar, King Dollar, Larry Kudlow, King Dollar. So still see no reason with the kind of things I do, except it being a turnaround Tuesday that I want to short it here. Uh, but I uh, just want to point out the yen with all this dollar strength. The yen led the rally, right? The yen's been uh, as strong or stronger than the dollar, especially last week. So uh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, I really suggest everyone join and hang out with Amanda Sweeney in our chat room. I'm telling you, she's a top gun. You know, I have people on Twitter commenting, guys like Brian Twomey, who's been following following her for quite some time and uh, he's an expert in his own right and says that her stuff is excellent. So if you haven't done it yet, at least take a trial. Uh, I think you should take a 20-year uh, membership. We're, we're coming up with, that's not a lifetime, but 20-year membership for the price of 10. That's our new promo. So you get a 20-year, anyone interested in a 20-year membership? Give me why if you're. I know I am. I'm, I'm signed up. So that means you guys are stuck with me for another 18 years. Can you believe that? I'm going to be around for another 18 years? Man, huh? <laughs> All right. All right. So anyway, uh, turn around Tuesday and, you know, if I'm going to fade anything, I want to see what happens here in the yen. Here's a one hour and it's just a scalp. It would be counter trend because obviously the trend's up. Let's see where the RSI is. If the Japanese yen makes a new high up here, give me a Y if you understand it. So, you know, uh, we were confirming there was a little divergence here, but the readings were too much momentum. Ideally, you want to see divergences with the RSI under 70. That's what I teach. They're better setups and uh, even better if there's more than one. So we'll see what happens with the yen. Uh, also, uh, uh, I just want to show you a, a simple um, method I use. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, if you could count to two, you could do it. So, um, Here's uh, the sell-off yesterday we had in the indexes, and here's the NASDAQ 100. And this candle right here, the low was 7086. Uh, anyway, it's a two-week reversal system. Uh, it's not really a system. It's just something I learned from somebody else, uh, I don't know, 30, 20 years ago or so, maybe longer. But all you do is you go to the weekly chart. So here's the weekly NASDAQ. And you just count back two weeks from this week. And since it's a weekly chart, you look at the close. So the close here was 7082. 7082 was the off number. And sometimes the market will go to it and uh, you'll get a reaction off it. So here the low was, you know, right in the neighborhood, got down to 73, but there were a couple touches right around 80. So there's a, a gift to you guys. Check it out. Write down the numbers and see how they come into play. Just something else to put in your toolbox. So um, my guess, and Cruz, you know, trying to rally after a bad week, kind of like what it did back here and rallied back to new highs to clean out all the bears with a stop hunt. So my bet right here is that, I don't know, maybe we're going to go to 56.80, you know, take out this high, maybe 57. But I'm betting we take out these lows before we make a new high. So you have some FIB levels up here. It'll probably tie into, you know, maybe another sell-off in the market. If the market's going to blow and a lot of people are talking, you know, 28.50, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's possible if we have could just put in one lower high, which we're going to find out about right now, right? Here's your break. If we could put in one lower high wherever this terminates, then I think you have something. A lot of people looking at this 2760 range in the S&Ps as being, I think it's 64. 
as being an important uh, area. And the VIX really exploded. I remember I asked Steve yesterday to take a look at the VIX and, you know, what a huge move and what a huge give back. So it, this is also possible that, you know, we're not going to revisit just like the S&Ps may not revisit their highs if we're going to take out 2764. Um, VIX may not see a new low. You know, I'm not saying it can't jiggle down to 14 and again, but you see this high right here? Pretty powerful. And I know VIX is a kind of a weird instrument, but if you just go by the reading, it's a confirmed high. So uh, what that implies on the real simple implicator is there's a potential for another high. So be careful in equities. Maybe a good time to put on hedges, uh, raise cash. Um, and I just want to look at uh, one more thing. I think it's yields. So, you know, I've been talking about the potential for higher yields, and, you know, that's also part of the end scenario. Also, uh, we may have ended the correction in cryptos, okay? Came back to what the 50% level was. So, look, cryptos are looking pretty good. But I just wanted to show the 10 year yield. You know, um, this was a, a, a real strong, powerful wave. And, you know, maybe we're going to get an ABC, but really uh, looking for the possibility, if we hold the moving average right here, of heading up towards, you know, the 280 range. So uh, this could be a breakout. Back under 268, I would say, comes back into doubt. But you would think the yen would continue to give us strength, although it led, uh, it may begin to wane. Uh, the yen way outperformed the move in yields. So if the, we're going to 285 to 290 up here, uh, it can be interesting to see where the yen's at when yields are up at that area. Because you know, after that, I think there's, you know, they're just shaking out all the bond bulls right now. But after this rally completes, uh, there's a very good chance that um we're gonna head back down again into the low twos so here's your weekly moving average comes in at 290 as well so after this rally whenever it completes occurs then we could see something like this from up here and take you down under this 50 week 200 week i mean 232 at least so to me this is a you know just a correction i don't think we're going right to new highs and it probably ties in with uh, when we get the next wave down in risk. So uh, that's what I wanted to share with you. Uh, you're very welcome, Forex Gal. Any questions for me before I turn it over to Blake? Are you guys enjoying being in face? We're approaching two years of uh, doing our best for free to help people. Hope that it's added value to what you're trying to accomplish as a trader. But I do want to stress it's only the tip of the iceberg. And if you're really serious about the business, you have to invest in yourself, okay? And to, I think being a member here uh, is an investment in yourself. Oh yeah, the New York trip, yeah, that's coming up this weekend. So that's a great opportunity for everyone to, um, Meet some of the team in person. So you get all these notifications here. I'm four behind, right? So let's take a look at. And Steve's having a cocktail party here. Okay, so it's limited to uh, 20 people. I'm kidding. So that the tab isn't too big. Don't come there just to have drinks come there to learn and press the flesh with the team and get to know us and tell no, your no, friends no, about no, it. No, no, you're coming there to get drinks. If you're going to the drink, uh, yeah, you're going to right. get drinks. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> Go get loaded and, and meet, the meet, the, meet the team. <laughs> drinks, drinks on Steve. You'll even like him more, possibly. But no, possibly. Ang no angry drunks allowed. All right. <laughs> like, I know some people, 
they kind of turn a little vicious after a few. It's usually tequila. Tequila is a tequila is a, the uh, yeah. usually the what what puts people over the edge. I think my worst hangover ever. Yeah, when I was a lot lot, lot younger. So anyway, <laughs> uh, it's amazing I could still remember it uh, with old timers disease. But uh, <laughs> what what are you thinking here, uh, man? Uh, you know. I, I saw your <laughs> I saw your Skype that you know uh, the guys will be gone and uh, we'll be a little short-handed and uh, that's when the S and P will be down five percent. Yeah, I mean, that's probably, chances are that's probably going to happen. Uh, you know, it's like volatility is like putting us all to sleep. Uh, we yeah. are seeing a little volatility in the cable this morning, um, but uh, but you know, overall, it's been just a very sleepy market and. Um, yeah, you know, when the guys, when the guys, uh, leave their desks, uh, that's probably when the volatility is going to pick up. Does it happen you, to you how many times? Oh, I mean, gosh. some on big day. Yeah. It, I, you know, I'm not as good as I used to be. It used to be <laughs> when I go on vacation, whenever yeah. I'd leave, I was going to be out of town. I was going to be away from the desk for a day. It was like, it was, it was clockwork for many years. And now I'm not so good at that. I, I'm not as good as I used to be, but, uh, yeah. but maybe it's, it's, uh, it's, turn the tide towards us, uh, Steve and Joe and, and Greg. So we'll see. But um, l let's talk a little bit about uh, the volatility we're seeing in the cable this morning. So there, the between the um, the the Cox-Barnier um, uh, meeting, the, they didn't expect uh, any breakthroughs in the meeting. So the cable came under some pressure. You can see how the pound sold off. Now, we, we, are, we are just below the 38% retracement of this last move. But we're testing, really, this is, you can see this is the big, you know, support zone. You can you can draw it like this. Actually, it's probably a better way to draw it is uh, something like this. We're 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 testing like the support zone right now, and it's just below the 38% retracement. Maybe even enough just to stop out some traders. I actually picked up some cable. Uh, my average is at. Let me look at it. My average is at 25 right now. So I have a little little piece, and um, but I am short the euro pound, so that's kind of up in my face a little bit as well. But um, I'm not really too terribly worried about it as long as we stay around here. I don't want us to drop much further. Um, but but yeah, I picked up a little bit of cable on this dip, and uh, and just because this is like I said, this is a 38 percent retrace. And if you look at it from more of a a longer term, I, I guess I can let me get rid of this. Uh, and Blake, when you have a chance, I'd love to see your Dixie chart. Um, yeah, because it's so relentless. I'm wondering if you have anything that might you know make this advanced pause or anything like that well okay well I, i'll 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 take a look at that here in a moment so okay buddy. you know we we might be developing a a more of a longer term flag pattern here too as long as we can hold these levels so i just don't want to see the cable much lower than 131 we just probed 131 stops just a moment ago just just below there and we're popping right back up again i think people really want to by the cable, I think that overall we are looking at you know um, a, a, a no uh, a no deal Brexit being priced out. It's just you know obviously a little bit of stutter step in the negotiations is you know causing a little bit of selling in the cable. But I think overall people are trying to buy cable on these dips. So uh, I'm you know attempting to join them as well, and um, and and so that's that's what's uh, I, I think we could we could have a you know a kind of a flag pattern building here, and you know you can look at it like this, or you know I'm just kind of um, you know, drawing some rough, uh, you know, kind of trend lines that could look something like this, and and you know, we could we could be developing some sort of flag. And I, I'm I'm like I said, I'm not too terribly worried about it. Uh, I, I'm trying to pick it up on dips. It's always, you know, it's the trades that make you sick are usually the good trades, the ones where you pick up and you're like, Bleh, I'm gonna barf, and then you know, that's those end up being the the ones that are. You know, the better better trades you know especially when you're buying into you know an, a, a trend if you think that the trend is higher overall um, and you know trying to buy dips is always going to be the uh, is always going to be the, the the tougher thing to do but we'll see I like I said I, I want us to really um, get a foothold above the the 131 level and 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 back up to 13150 would be ultimately great um, now you you asked to see the dollar index. The dollar index, you know, the dollar index is pretty technical right now. I'm, I know we don't have a whole lot of volatility in the markets. It's been very 
which is crappy volatility. But if you look at the dollar index, we we've we, we basically let me get that. Okay, so we're we're challenging the six one eight. We're we're just bounced okay. off this. This is a okay. broken trend line. Okay, right. yeah. we tested the broken trend line perfectly. Right. Came up to the six one eight, and we're just bouncing up against the six one eight. So, um, this could be. You know, a little, and this is a four-hour chart, so you know, it just kind of a little with triangle, me. a little wedge. You know, yeah. a little, little wedge building, and um, you know, could we eventually break out to the upside? Sure, but if we fail here, uh, you know, if we if we fail here, we could you know come right back down again. And this, you can see the six one eights here, also rejected there. But you know, a breakout would be quite bullish for for the dollar index. So I think. You know, you just kind of got to you know, just try wait. to wait, you know. Yeah, there's it's not. Hurry it's, up and wait, Blake. It's, 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 it stinks, you know. This is like kind of, this is such a bad, it's such a bad Tom market Petty right said now. it, bro. The waiting is the hardest part. Tom Petty. <sighs> Sorry to bore you. The, the late, great Tom Petty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was great, wasn't he? He was. He really was. Um, no, you're not boring me. It's just a market. <laughs> uh, so here, here's the dollar yen. You talked about the dollar yen. You know, we, we came under pressure yesterday. Equities, you know, sold off. Uh, yesterday, the dollar yen pop, uh, you know, sold off a little bit. And we popped right back again. I mean, the, 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 I have to admit, you know, the dollar yen is pretty resilient. It is not... Yeah. selling off and I think in the it, when we have this low volatility environment you know everybody's talking about the carry trade so you know the the the, the market is still looking for uh, you know selling low yielding currencies picking up the the higher yielding currencies and that's going to keep the um, the dollar yen basically uh, under well the yen under pressure keeping upside pressure on the dollar yen until we see some sort of volatility pickup uh, the dollar yen is likely just to continue to be uh, sideways if not higher just kind of thanks grinding. for showing that dollar chart to me bro the what thank you the dollar the Dixie oh the Dixie yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You. you're you're welcome um so you know as far as the dollar yen goes and unless volatility picks up we're probably going to continue to grind higher i do think that we're challenging some pretty key resistance so the better thing to do in my opinion is buying the dollar yen at 111 uh versus trying to pay up here you know so you want to wait for a little bit of a pullback on the dollar yen to see if you can get get a better price uh, if possible uh the euro dollar is pretty quiet today um we uh we we rejected the 50 percent retracement as we talked about on the week ahead video and uh we've rolled over but there but there's you know what are you going to do down here do you do you really want to do you really want to short it you're probably at a 50 percent retracement right now and you're basically at the 50 percent retracement currently so you don't want to you know i i think traders are a little nervous about trying to chase it lower but at the same time, it's like, do you really want to be a buyer here either? So, you know, there's not a not a lot of impetus to do much with the with the euro at this point. The the Aussie, um, we had the RBA last night. Not not a lot of um, not a lot of uh, 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 volatility following the RBA. But I'll tell you, the, the Aussie has not been acting too well. I mean, the Aussie is trading pretty heavy, uh, and I think now we're starting to risk a move back. You know, below the 70 cent level. Um, you know, if I was long the Aussie, knowing that, wow, okay, there's going to be a China-U.S. trade deal more than likely. Um, why am I, you know, uh, why is the Aussie getting hit here? Well, if a deal gets announced, I mean, what? How's the Aussie going to respond? I, I've been in the camp, and most of you guys know this about me. I've been in the camp that if if and when China and the U.S. announce some sort of trade agreement, I'm going to short the Aussie, uh, especially if we get a pop. Um, you know, if there, there's a there's an agreement in principle, uh, I'm I'm going to short a, a rally in the Aussie because I believe that whatever China U.S. trade deal is put together, there's going to be less demand in Australia 
more demand in you know in the U.S. and it's going to be it, it, the the overall deal is going to be worse for China, better for the U.S. and and it's ultimately going to be worse for for uh, for Australia as well. So I think that you know selling the Aussie on any rally is what I want to do. The problem is is it's not even rallying. You know even with the anticipation coming of of some sort of Chinese agreement, the Aussie is still trading heavy. So we we could really see. Um, some downside pressure at some point. I'm I'm not short the Aussie at the moment. I just I think that it's trading very poorly. Uh, the Kiwi is right at support. We're at uh, the 78% retracement right here. Trend line support. Uh, I think the risk is that that the 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 Kiwi makes its way back down towards 67 cents soon. I think that that is a risk. And um, and uh, the dollar Canadian, we have this inverted head and shoulder pattern. We are above the neckline right now, and uh, and we're making our way higher at this moment. Hold on one second. Okay. Um, so. Anyway, the the dollar Canadian has this inverted uh, head and shoulder pattern. We're we're right at the neckline, and um, I picked up some dollar max this morning, a little cheaper, and then uh, I, I already got out of it. And I've been kind of scalping around, just trying to play this to the upside as well. Um, but overall, guys, it's been a pretty pretty quiet market. I think we're going to be watching the cable closely today. I know I am. So um, I'm just kind of trading around a, a little position here. I don't know if I want to stay long, but we'll see how it reacts. But uh, with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Steve and Stelios as they prepare, uh, or at least Steve prepares to come to New York. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good Hello, morning. Hey, hey, and uh, and and I'm 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 gonna have to step off the desk for for a few minutes, but uh, but I wanted to say I hope you guys have a great trading session, and I I know you'll talk about uh, our sponsors and and the and the New York Expo, so I'm gonna let you guys take over. Thanks, guys. Good luck today, Thanks, Blake. Blake. Thanks, guys. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi, Stelz. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> okay. Good, buddy. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me um, let me just take over briefly and mention a few things. Uh, first of all, we had the RBA. Blake mentioned that it was um, it was actually more. Uh, it, there were there were a few dovish. Um, uh, you know, if you compare the two statements of this month and the last month, there was a couple of dovish items thrown in. You know, they mentioned that the economy slowed in the second half of 2018. But the the all important last paragraph, which really summarizes what um, the RBA is thinking more or less, that was unchanged completely. So um, uh, maybe the market was expecting for something a little bit more dovish, but basically the, the Aussie is not, you know, it's slightly lower against the dollar, but the dollar is higher against everything today. So it's not really underperforming um, on the back of the RBA. Um, so that that was the RBA, and we have we also had some numbers to, today um, out of uh, eurozone. We had some people and PMIs and the, sorry, Australia. We we also had Australian numbers, right? We had the current account. Current account, the yeah. Fourth quarter, yes. it was a little bit better than expected, decently better actually. Yeah. Well, the revision also was worse though. So it, I think overall, um, you know, okay, maybe slightly better than expected, but really nothing uh, nothing major. Um, we had PMIs out of the Eurozone services PMI. It was uh, better than expected, even in Italy. So there you go. And um, so that bitter. gave, yeah, so that gave the Euro a little bit of a lift. Um, uh, we had uh, UK services PMI came in at 51.3, expected at 49.9. So that beat as well. Um, the interesting uh, quote, which I saw uh, about an hour ago, and I actually giggled a little bit. You know, we've all forgotten about Italy now. Remember, there was a huge deal about uh, the budget deficit, and there were uh, the Italians wanted 2.6 percent, the Europeans wanted 2 percent. Then they came in somewhere in the middle. Well, we had a, a, um, a quote from uh, one of uh, the Lega Nord, um, uh, you know, senior members, uh, a guy called. Bagnai, if I say this Bagnai or whatever, you know, I, I can't pronounce it properly. And he said that it would be difficult for the European Commission to sanction Italy if they raise their deficit to manage their economic slowdown. So that means, you know, we we agreed on something, but really, if we need to, we're going to raise it and there's not much you can do. That's what they're saying. 
So, and if you remember, Steve, this is what we talked about at the time as well. You know, they can say whatever number they want, but at the end of the Absolutely. day, this, this can all change. It can be whatever, whatever the hell they want it to be. So that was interesting. Um, and the other thing which we had, and we have to um, make a note of this, uh, even though it's not the currency we cover, the um, Chinese yuan, um, it definitely plays a huge role on, on global economies. So what happened yesterday is that um, China, they they lowered their GDP forecasts and um, uh, sl slightly lower it. I think they went to six to six and a half percent range, uh, which which is, I think, about half percent lower than they had it before. And they raised their budget deficit by a little bit as well. And um, it looks like Chinese, the Chinese economy, it in line with pretty much all the other major economies it's looking like it's taking a turn lower you know slow turn lower we know nothing major there's no hard landing. Is, that, is that code is that code for they're gonna let the one uh go uh below seven <coughs> uh, or above seven meaning that they you know maybe yeah. they put this out near the end of uh, these negotiations saying you know if we don't come to terms you know we're gonna do what we did last year and let the let the wand go so uh, we don't get hurt as much by tariffs by having a weaker currency. Is that possible, bro? It, it is definitely possible, you know, to say it in a sideways way yeah. like they are now. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. they, the they also, it, it's, it's a very good comment. And they also did say that they're going to cut um, uh, quite a bit in taxes and they're going to increase infrastructure investment. They're going to uh, raise lending to small firms. So they're going to try and boost um, a stimulus basically for, for their economy. So, yeah, you know, domestic. Yeah, exactly. So that's in line with what you were saying, um, uh, Dale. And uh, it's something Coach. that we have to keep an eye on. <laughs> Coach, I've changed yeah. my name. <laughs> it's legal. <laughs> 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 Sorry, we need to see the, paper, the paperwork first before we acknowledge. Uh, that. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, someone told me it's better for me. You know, some you know some uh, new age kind of stuff or mystical stuff. They have five letters in my name, so I had to change my name uh, <laughs> from Dale to Coach. Four, four letters, not enough, right? <laughs> I, I don't know. It was bringing me bad luck. They said. I said, yeah. oh, I don't know. I've I've been very lucky, fortunately. Lucky. Okay. Let, anyway, let's see what happens with five letters. I, <laughs> we, you and might get 25 percent more fortunate <laughs> <all right. laughs> um otherwise um not much else to say uh De blake actually did uh, talk about the the meeting between cox and barnier uh they expect no breakthrough that's what has been said so far and also a, a spokesman for the uk said that there is still lots of work to do on the backstop so the market's getting a little bit excited about the potential of either a delay for Article 50 or some kind of deal, but uh, these guys are someone, reminding us. Someone that. named Cox was talking about the backstop. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm going to write it exactly. down. <laughs> hey, Stel, uh, Stel, you notice that uh, no sec spread today? Look at look at what it's doing today. I haven't seen that's it, actually. What is it doing? So, so you know, I was asking you about it yesterday. So yes. it's approaching an even better sell zone for you, because that's what you were looking to do. That seasonal trade to the upside, you you know, long no short sec. Yeah. If we break yeah. out above this uh, trend line, it's going to be you know, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it should it should produce some very nice um you know continuation. Yeah. But you know, so far we're uh, we still we still remain capped. Yes. Yeah. In this uh, I mean, symmetrical triangle, I, I like this pair to the upside, but I would only really look at uh, going long if it gets close to the uh, the bottom end of that uh, triangle. Is the triangle, yeah. yeah. So like unless one of one of, one of four. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless it breaks out, of course, yeah, yeah. Because Thank if you. it does, it should be nice. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, so still you're nothing to write home about. I mean, yeah, the, the better uh, PMIs were definitely, uh, you know. Um, uh, good. Uh, also, by the way, since I know that Josh spoke about that, so I don't forget um, in um, uh, Real Vision about the USD czar, we also had South African uh, GDP for fourth quarter. It came in uh, worse than expected, 1.4 versus uh, 1.8. Uh, that was expected and, you know, uh, versus the previous reading, which was 2.6. Um, so, you know, but we haven't seen some uh, some good follow through. 
so far, uh, regardless, use these are is above this uh, big triangle. So I do think that um, um, you know this this trade might might play play out you know quite nicely uh, during the next the next few weeks. Um, so you know that has to do with data. Today we have uh, services PMI coming up for the US, uh, ISM non manufacturing as well. New home sales, which you know uh, the forecast is abysmal, minus eight point seven, um, and we have IVPMI for uh, Canada. All of them coming within uh, the next uh, one and a half uh, hours from now. Um, anyhow, having said that, uh, obviously the pound is uh, you know uh, quite uh, under quite a lot of pressure today. We've been uh, giving up. Uh, more of the recent gains. If we go back to the four-hour chart, you can see Blake showed this. Uh, I, you know, I was monitoring this as a channel. We seem to be breaking below it, and then we have this previous channels uh, trend line that, you know, generally a nice uh, confluence of supports, roughly at 130.30. I think that if we make it below that, uh, you know, it's not going to be a good sign for the pound. Euro is performing somewhat better today. That's why we have this. Uh, um, this behavior from Euro pound, which is actually resuming its uh, rebound because probably the good PMIs, good and you know, better than expected PMIs from uh, Europe are helping uh, the Euro um, overperform the pound. So, you know, we're seeing this rebound. Regardless, I think that the Euro pound still um, remains, uh, you know, decently bearish, although this has been uh, rather an expanding um, uh, range, but uh, you know we definitely uh, made it now above this uh, first area of resistance. Uh, so I think that you know the next area of resistance we might make it there is at 87.30. Um, so uh, you know Euro USD not doing much, and as I said, you know uh, what I'm looking for uh, is this uh, triangle. You know I've changed, I had to change my drawings like multiple times here because. Uh, you know, um, volatility uh, is, is is dropping by the day in Euro USD, and you know nothing is happening. Several formations that you know end up not playing out. Um, anyhow, um, you know this is the situation with those now having to do with the Aussie and and the Kiwi. As I said yesterday, the Aussie uh, is threatening a breakdown from uh, this likely it's a triangle. Uh, regardless, I think that this uh, seventy. 30, 70, 40 horizontal support area um, is going to be quite key. If we do break below it, I think we're going to see more weakness. Um, oppositely, uh, you know, Kiwi is, is in the middle of a triangle that still, you know, gives it some room to, to move to the downside without uh, actually breaking out. Uh, now, I wouldn't even, uh, you know, rule out another push to the upside as, as long as we remain uh, trapped here. Um, but as you see, you know, those two, are also uh, not doing us any favors. I mean, you know, they're not producing something that is actionable, something that is tradable. Unless you're a scalper and you're looking like a, you know, five, 15 minute starts, I don't think there is much uh, to do here. Uh, yesterday, uh, Blake uh, mentioned in the chart of the day, I don't know if you're uh, watching this, you know, we have a free uh, blog site, you know, every, every day we have like a chart of the day. Yesterday, uh, Blake mentioned the Aussie Kiwi. Aussie Kiwi still, uh, finding support here at uh, the 61.8, but it does look like it can, uh, at any given point, break to the downside and you know produce some follow through. The next downside target would be at 102. So you know I, I still favor more weakness from the side of uh, the Aussie due to that. And if we want to have a look at the Aussie against um, the yen, nothing has changed here as well. I, I still think that you know uh, being unable to uh, push through this resistance zone, there is a decent uh, probability that we're going to actually got, get rejected. And Kiwi Yen, more or less the same situation. Kiwi looks better than the Aussie, but still uh, there is a you know a, a definite loss of upside momentum um, for now. Um, let me also open the question. What do you guys are asking? Uh, Euro Yen. Yeah, we have a question about the Euro Yen and actually about the Pound Yen as well. So let's, let's have a look at them. So Euro Yen. Euro yen, since last week I was monitoring this ascending uh, channel, as you see, we briefly uh, probed above it both on Friday and yesterday. But, uh, you know, this channel is still holding. If we go 
uh, to a lower time frame, to a four hour chart, you can see that. There we go. Uh, you know, I was also looking at this channel. So, you know, if you go down to a four hour chart, there's even a potential bullish interpretation here. Uh, it depends on how you draw the channel because if you go on the daily, you can actually uh, draw it in a way that, you know, it hasn't broken out yet. So, uh, I think that, um, you know, there is still a stand. This price action to, to begin with, to the upside, doesn't look that bullish. So, uh, I really wouldn't um, uh, be surprised if uh, Euro Yen uh, actually rolled over and, you know, moved lower as in general the Yen complex. But I have to say that in the short term, um, if you look at the four hour chart, you can see that, uh, you know, we've, we've had some break uh, higher and, you know, we came down, we retested. Uh, briefly, uh, this channel and and its holding. So you know, quite mixed uh, signals. Uh, I would still favor, as I said, the downside. But uh, you know, um, you know, quite cautious. I think we need more price action. And if you see, the pound yen also produced. Um, uh, you know, first of all, the pound yen was uh, you know restricted in the channel for quite a long time. We had a brief. Um, breakdown from this channel, but this lasted like one day or whatever it was. Then we uh, jumped back um, within the channel. We then briefly poked above it, uh, and now we're we're actually um, you know about to enter the channel once again. So you know, in general, as you see, we have some price action that is uh, more or less you know descending. I mean, if we go to the daily chart, there it is. You can see that. There is a daily chart. You can see that this was a bullish breakout. You can see it more clearly here. Um, but, you know, I want to see some follow through, right? As long as this uh, broken channel is holding, though, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw another leg to the upside. Obviously, you know, between euro and pound yen, if I wanted to be a uh, long one, that would be pound yen. I do think that there are high chances. Um, that, you know, we're going to have some more news from, uh, you know, the UK that might, um, you know, uh, sustain a bid uh, for both the cable and uh, the pound yen. Um, obviously, you know, for the pound yen, we also need um, a risk to remain decently bid because if we have some, some big turn lower in the risk, the yen factor is going to uh, affect it. But I have to say that, you know, this uh, channel that was actually in place since the very beginning of the year, uh, you know, just got recently uh, violated to the upside. So, you know, I don't want to go against that, right? I was expecting that we might see another rejection from there and move lower. But since we broke above it, you know, I wouldn't want to fight this. Uh, Euro yen, uh, much easier to do so. Um, Steve, hi, what do you think of gold, pound Aussie, pound Q? Okay, let's begin by the pound pairs that you're asking for, since we are already talking about pound pairs. So, pound Aussie. Uh, pound Aussie, first of all, if we isolate the recent past year, you can see, let's say, you know, from February, okay? Now, if we want to see the price action from February, this looks like a megaphone formation, right? You can see it here clearly. So there is really no trend here, right? I mean, every leg is extending more than the previous leg. And, you know, we get, we get a bullish and bearish legs, uh, you know, one after the other. So, uh, you know, I have to say that uh, I don't think that there is, you know, a trend in the medium term. Uh, but, you know, the closer we get to, you know, this uh, trend line that I'm showing you here, the higher the chance that we're going to get another rejection. And if, if we zoom in closer, you're going to see that, first of all, so far we got rejected from the previous high exactly, right? Which is definitely not a very good sign for the bulls because they didn't manage to, uh, to actually reclaim, um, uh, you know, the upper hand by, by breaking above it. Um, and, you know, even if we did break, uh, you know, above it, there was this ascending channel, its trend line was, uh, you know, just a little bit higher, uh, in which case I would be expecting some kind of a reaction. So what happens from here? First of all, there is a quite interesting zone here at 184.40. You can see it. It has been uh, acting as support resistance, uh, you know, several times uh, since March. So 
uh, first of all, I want to see what's going to happen if we retest this zone. And second of all, I want to see even if this breaks, what's going to happen when we retest this ascending channel support. So, you know, until we break below this ascending channel, you know, you have to respect uh, the upside. Keeping in mind, though, as I said, that there is no real trend uh, for, you know, uh, since whatever, February that was. So, um, you know, the higher we are, uh, the more it looks good in the short term to be short. But, you know, in order for me to be looking aggressively shorter, I, I, you know, lower, I would, I would want to see this trend line uh, break down and then uh, look for continuation. Okay. Until that happens, something like this might actually uh, take place. So, you know, the key level is roughly at 183.40 at the moment, but 184.50 is also quite a nice area of support. So, you know, those levels are the ones that matter. Pay attention to them and, you know, act accordingly because I don't know what's your personal bias. The situation with pound kiwi is not much different. I mean, first of all, long term uh, ascending uh, channel. I mean, since uh, January 2016. So, I mean, you know, this is a multi year um, ascending channel. The characteristics of this channel are clearly corrective so far. So, I have to say that. You know, if you're asking me what's the next big move for the pound kiwi, it really looks like it might be lower. But, you know, being in the middle of the channel, nobody tells us that we can't actually, you know, uh, resume to the upside, come closer to this uh, longer term um, channel resistance before we actually see some uh, downside price action. So now if we come a little bit closer to the price action and we see what's happening here, first of all, we had this uh, horizontal support, the resistance area that has, um, you know, um, played uh, its role here. We, we were seeing uh, the pair getting rejected. We also have this ascending channel. We briefly broke below it, but in general, the market has been, uh, you know, has been respecting it. So the situation in, in the short term is not much different than with the pound Aussie. You need to respect the upside. But keep in mind the 61.8, we almost made it there, this horizontal support resistance area. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be long here, and especially if we break below this uh, trend line once again, I will be looking for lower uh, prices. And if we uh, end up breaking below this uh, blue um, channel trend line, then I'm going to be looking quite a lot lower because, as I told you, this looks to me like a long term uh, corrective move. And, you know, when it finally breaks, I think it should produce a very decent amount of uh, downside. So, you know, this is what I think with the pound kiwi. I think that the pound Aussie looks uh, cleaner, uh, you know. Uh, so if I had to trade one of the two, I would go for uh, the pound Aussie. Hey, Steve, uh, uh, can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. Uh, our, get, our guest today is, uh, you know, I use the link for him to get in that Velo tweets, and he's saying mm -hmm. that it, uh, it's not working. The login so could you skype me a, a login that might work for him i don't know why it's not but maybe i need a different one sure. for him uh, i'll do that i'll do that right now okay thank you thank you thank you thank you guys so um we have questions now about uh the metals about nasdaq okay let's let's start with indices first of all uh s p uh was looking like it's going to have quite a bearish close yesterday uh bearish key reversal but once again, the plants protection team managed, uh, you know, close to the end of the session to um, help the index pull back. Uh, you know, it, it, it actually uh, managed to um, reclaim uh, much of its losses, closed once again within this ascending uh, wedge. So, you know, nothing really to report here. Now we have a specific question about the NASDAQ. So let's have a look at it. As you see, the NASDAQ also within what looks like a likely ascending wedge. As you see, there is a clear um, loss of momentum. I mean, just look at the uh, uh, rate of um, increase that we had as long as we remained in this uh, red ascending channel. And now we've uh, decelerated uh, while being in this wedge. So I would still favor uh, some kind of a rejection and the move lower, but, you know, we don't have confirmation. Yet. So, you know, we, we need to remain patient. Same deal with the IWM. IWM was appreciating literally in a V-shaped uh, fashion. Uh, you know, um, momentum slowed down a little bit. Then we had another accel uh, acceleration of momentum, but it looked like being an unsustainable since uh, it was within an ascending wedge. 
we did break below the ascending wedge after reaching this resistance, but so far the uh, follow through to the downside has been unimpressive. Uh, so, you know, I would want to see some kind of an acceleration lower for me to... Yeah. Uh, Under yesterday's low might do it in some of these indexes. What do you think? Might, but with the recent, you know, huge rally that we've had, doesn't feel like it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's enough in any way. So even if we push the new highs from there, I will still consider that, you know, there is a there is at least a very decent correction correction missing. So I'm not going to qualify these pullbacks as enough of a corrective move. So uh, even if we push the new highs, I will be looking for a bigger correction to come rather soon and, you know, not, you know, sometime afterwards. Um, uh, you know, since we uh, got into the, the indexes, I have to say that the DAX did complete, uh, you know, it tagged two consecutive days yesterday and on Friday, the inverted head and shoulders formations um, target at 11, you know, 11,670. Um, you know, so far after reaching the target, we are seeing uh, the index uh, stalling. But as I've said multiple times, I think the most key level to watch out for here is the 11,800. It was the neckline of this big head and shoulders formation here. And I do think that the market is going to probably have a, you know, a tough time uh, breaking above it once we retest it from uh, below. Putsi? Robert Dunn, I just want to say thank you, Steve. Thank you, Stell, for the good link, Robert Dunn. I see you in here. We're on in 14 minutes. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. And if I finish and cover the questions, we can even go, uh, you know, earlier. Now, uh, one of the indices I wanted to show, and you remember that, Dale, very well. You remember that I was talking about a potential breakout in the Shanghai Composite, right? Yeah, and EEM. I mean, you, yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah Shanghai, look, I remember that. Yeah, look what has happened. Here. Yeah. I mean, after breaking out from this uh, triangle, we've had yeah, another 16% higher. Right. Yeah, right so off, this, this has been an explosive move higher. I hope some of you could, uh, you know, had access to trade this. Now the daily RSI has actually reached like 83 more, you know, higher uh, readings yeah. than 83. So obviously right. it, it, it is bound for some kind of a, you know, short term pullback. But I have to say that this breakout here and this momentum that we're seeing uh, validate, you know, that this is like a, you know, a reliable move. The FXI has also broken uh, higher, you know, not as strong of a move, but it still has broken higher. And the emerging market. Yeah, uh, we called that before it broke out. So all I can say is fade Steve Volge at your peril, your own peril. That's all I can say. <laughs> all right, because uh, I've tried so, it. Don't do it. I've tried it. So nice breakout <laughs> in them. And, you know, um, that, that was another uh, thing I was looking at, the Australian um index this was a perfect example of what we call an overthrow this was a perfect wedge we then had an overthrow i bet this overthrow uh you know mm -hmm. lower uh got a lot of people uh getting out of this market just at you know at the turning point and look what has happened since i mean a huge move higher so far channeled but you know there is now a clear loss of momentum here as well uh, we we are striving to hold support. So it looks to me like the um, uh, Australian 200 index is also probably closer to a corrective move lower than anything else. But I have to say that this move higher looks rather impulsive. So any pullback, I will consider it to be uh, corrective until uh, proven um, otherwise. So now that we've covered those, we can go back to the rest of the questions. We had a question about the USD CAD. And I have to say that you need to be careful here in the USD card because the USD card is attempting to break higher from this triangle, in which case it probably invalidates the scenario that we might have another uh, push lower. Actually, if you're looking at this as an inverted and shoulders formation, that means that we've already triggered this uh, formation. And if you really like it to the upside, that means that you can look forward to let's make let's measure this. Whoop, no, we need extension. Are you? There you are. So we are looking at a move towards there. 135, what is it? 135.84. Uh, so 135.84 is the target of this inverted head and shoulders formation. So it looks good for more upside. 
I, I, you know, I'm, I'm remaining a little bit skeptical because I want to see a daily close also because yesterday we were also breaking above this uh, trend line and we didn't manage to close above it. So, you know, before I actually hold my breath, I want to see a, a daily close above this trend line. Then um, I think you, you have every reason to, uh, you know, to take this trade if you actually like the USD card to the upside. Another correlated pair, we, we, we've talked several times about it, is, is the USD knock. In my opinion, if you want to belong, USD knock is probably even a better proposition. Why? Because it has produced a huge break higher from a very, very prolonged uh, consolidation, a corrective move lower. And, you know, we made several attempts to invalidate this breakout, but in every single case, uh, bulls stepped in. And, you know, this is something to take into account. So USD knock, in my opinion, a better proposition for a long USD card, a better proposition for a short, if you're looking uh, to short it, of course, I'm not advocating that you should. Um, now, uh, a brief look in crude, not that anything big has happened. As you see, um, you know, I had mentioned since, you know, days ago that, in my opinion, you need to respect this range, 55 to 58. So far, we are consolidating within this range, and I have to say that the longer we spend consolidating within this range without actually breaking below 55, the higher the chances that we're going to be correcting in time rather in, uh, you know, distance rather than price. So, you know, the longer we spend consolidating in here, I think that, you know, the, the more the chances uh, decrease that we're actually going to see prices go below 55 before another push uh, to the upside. So, you know, be a little bit careful here. If you're looking for a corrective move lower, it might not come just yet, right? And in any case, you know, 55 is a key level to watch. I wouldn't be jumping the gun um, before we get a confirmation that uh, this level is breaking. I mentioned yesterday that I'm not really worried about the pullback in copper because, you know, copper has broken above this rectangle. And, you know, as long as we remain above it, we should see uh, you know, sooner rather than later, continuation higher. Today's price action so far shows that, uh, you know, the bulls uh, are actually well in control of this. Um, um, so I don't think that anything you know, you're, you're a great example of what WD, what WD GAN says. If you don't learn how to change your mind, you won't have any change left because you were a big bear in copper and wrote it down and stayed with it for a while while it was kept testing the same breakout but once it turned uh, you uh, you changed your mind and yes, you, you know need to yeah. remain nimble and my interpretation yeah. was this daily if you remember it's a great if, great example yeah great example of someone being stubborn yeah if this was a triangle with yeah. with the resistance being you know this but support being that which up until a point it was looking like a nice triangle right Right. The, inter the interpretation was uh, that we should see a break lower and one more push to the downside. But right. then we found support there and we came up. So far, the bearish interpretation was looking good because, you know, you can easily come back, retest, uh, you know, the trend line. That big blue candle lower. that changed your mind. Yeah. And then we got that big blue candle and then you're like, yeah. hmm, you know, something... Something is looking, uh, you know, uh, a yeah, little bit Jack different. Be yeah. nimble, so, Jack, be quick. Steve jumped out on the candlestick. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so then you're left with only one interpretation, that you have a rectangle, and a perfect rectangle. I mean, it, 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 it was, you know, it, it, it held for a decent amount of time. Uh, so you expect that, you know, holding for a decent amount of time is important. Why? Because you know that the more uh, a range is holding, the more stop losses are, and limit orders are being built just outside the territory of that area, right? So you know that once you get a breakout, you know, there is going to be some follow through. So once, you know, since we broke to the upside, I think that, you know, uh, you shouldn't be fighting this. You shouldn't be fighting. That that doesn't mean that you can get a false breakout, but you you definitely shouldn't fight it because statistically speaking, there is a decent chance that um, this formation is gonna produce uh, you know some follow through and you know a decent for a decent chance that it's even gonna complete its target, which is uh, roughly up here in this 
um, area of resistance at 315, 317, uh, roughly there. So I do think that, uh, you know, people should be conscious of that. Now, having to do with gold, um, as I said yesterday, and the same deal applies, I mean, we're seeing some uh, short-term loss of momentum because we had, you know, a big move lower. I think that we now have clear indications that even if this is a corrective move, there is more downside for gold and silver. So gold and silver should be treated as, uh, you know, instruments that you should uh, be selling rallies. So I think that um, we should take advantage of any uh, pullback towards 1300 um, to, to short uh, gold, because I do think that it's headed lower, even even if this proves to be a corrective move of the rebound. Although I doubt that, I think that we might actually see uh, lower prices. Um, you know, we can even come down and retest this triangle. So uh, I, I believe there is a decent chance there is a lot more downside for gold. Uh, so far, we're seeing this move looking like a third wave for the last three, four days. So uh, I wouldn't be trying to fade this in, in, in any way. And here is silver, more or less the same deal here. So... Uh, that's what I think about it. And Steve, Steve, if was... we bounce first before getting to your lower targets, I know what you're going to be doing. Say we hold here like gold has uh, retested the low on the short-term stuff, uh, you know, uh, and just missed, and it is diverging short-term. So would you be a seller at 1300 1310 if we rallied right from here, 15 bucks or so? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm going to be I'm going to be scaling in if that happens. Yes, I'm going to be scaling it. You know okay. me. I rarely go in full position. Yeah. You know, you piece, you, you piece in, piece out. Love the style. Yeah. I, I think that uh, more people should adopt it in trying to be uh, have a perfect entry on a full position and a perfect out. Uh, it may happen once in a while that you can do that, but it's the exception, not the rule. So, you yes, know, check it exactly. out. If you're you're a one lot trader, full standard lot. Do 0 0.03, 0 0.03, 0 0.03, and come out the same way. I, I think you'll uh, it'll take a lot of the pressure off you. So it anyway. does. It does indeed. It does indeed. And you know something? Uh, it also gives you another ability. Let's assume that you have a level in mind that you want to start scaling in. Okay, and that level comes. So far, price action looks compelling. Compelling. I mean, to what yeah. you were looking for. So you you scale in and you put let's say one third of a position, and then you see an acceleration to, to, to that direction. And now you start not liking price action. And although it gets to the second uh, target that you had to put in a second third, you, you've now started feeling uncomfortable because you see that, you know, the momentum is not what you expected because you were expecting, you know, some slowdown in momentum to give you more indications that, um, you know, uh, whatever you're looking for. Was so you're wrong smaller. Point. You're wrong smaller when you do exactly. that. Exactly. Because it gives so you then, time to assess it. Yeah. So then psychologically, it feels much easier for you to say, you know, something, ah, you know, just, you know, just abandon this. I mean, I'm one third of a position. Sure. Just take some losses on one third of a position, which right in essence back. is like very little losses. And, you know, just, just let it be uh, because I don't like the price action anymore. Um, and that's it. And then it makes your psychologically, it makes your decision to uh, to abandon uh, much, much easier to take. Um, so, you know, this is another reason why I find this um, helpful. Um, now, we have Scott asking if I'm long copper. No, I'm not long copper. And the reason is, as I had explained some time ago, I don't like risk on. Uh, I'm not a perma bear. Uh, when I say I don't like a risk on is I don't think that the risk on we're seeing is in uh, is you know uh, has anything to do with what we're fundamentally seeing. I think there is a big gap between what the market expects in the moment and the reality. That means that I'm very very hesitant in taking positions that are highly correlated with risk on environment. Welcome back, coach. Okay. Um, that's why I, I, I intentionally wanted to be short copper on a confirmation of a breakdown, but I don't want to follow copper to the upside. I'm not saying it won't work. Uh, <laughs> it has a decent chance of working, but I don't want to go against my fundamental bias. Okay, okay, Scott, if that explains it. 
Um, if you want good indicator for on precious metals, look at COT report for commercial hedges. When commercial hedges are short, look for gold to go lower. But when they switch and go long, look for gold spot to get long gold because that usually signals reversal. That is true, Joseph. Although sometimes you see, you know, extreme readings and yeah. you think you think that, OK, you know, this is a good indication. But then you realize that readings can get a lot more extreme. How so, about this too, Steve? Uh, commercials have uh, deeper pockets than most retail traders. Oh, they, 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 they could be real early. Plus, they have the advantage of inventory if they're shorting it. So, Absolutely. you know, it's not. You, you still need to go to price action, in my opinion. Joseph. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, although I'm, I agree with you that you should take indices, uh, uh, positioning, and sentiment indices like the DSI, like the COTs, you should definitely you know take them into account i don't think that you should trigger a trade solely based on those okay that that that's my advice okay coach um, all right buddy uh, great you. review I will, i'm gonna be back tomorrow obviously um so enjoy the interview thank you very much robert dunn my chicago trading more your brother i'm making you the presenter uh it's been a long time looking forward to catching up with you robert how are you so you'll see a drop. You'll see a drop-down menu for your mic and sh screen. Sh oh, look! Oh, come on! It's like a <laughs> a trip down memory lane with Robert. Just waiting for your mic to be activated. Let's see if I have you muted. Okay, how about this now? Can you hear me? You're good. You're good, Robert. Wow! How how long's it been since you and I did this? A few it's years? been a while. It's been a long time. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, this is a pretty good segue since it's been a long time for you to tell us a little bit about how you got started and, you know, what you did. And uh, you and I are from the same generation that got to live the picture that you're showing. Um, uh, why don't you tell us, you know, how it happened, Robert? I mean, um, on my first trip to the CME, um, I got lost. I took the train and I actually got off at the merchandise mart and and I'm walking around there and I'm asking people where the trading floor is. And someone finally said, son, this is where wholesalers uh, show their goods. This is a merchandise mart, uh, not the mercantile exchange. So I had to get back on the L and go to the, and I finally made it to the gallery. So uh, why don't you tell us how it happened for you? What was your first gig in the business, bud, Bob? Uh, let's see, I'm just trying to get this camera off. There. Yeah, okay. Uh, my my first gig in the business, well, uh, I was a mechanic be before that and um, working on race cars and and, and engines. Wow. And, uh, I had friends that were down at the exchange. You know, I, I knew they worked, you know, they were done at work by, you know, at 2 o'clock. I would see them at the park playing basketball. Yeah. So 30, you know, there's a full court game going on and there's a bunch of people there. You know, I would be driving by the park because I'd be picking something up for work and I'd have to, you know, go across town. So I'd pass by. What and park? I'd, Hollywood Park. Okay. All right. Peterson and and Kedzie. Right. And, um, you know, and I, I, I'd see these full court games going on at 2.30 and, and I'm like, I'd recognize cars there i'd pull over and I'd, I'd see you know boys and i'd you know hey what's you know what you guys don't work well yeah we're we're we're, we're done he says what do you mean you're done it's 2 30 out you go oh yeah well we're done you know at that time when i was talking to these guys it was just agricultural products so um you know and they were done the last one to close was something like 145 so, you know, by 2.30, you could conceivably be at the park and you're playing basketball and, you know, things are happening. So I, I saw this and, and I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. I says, you're done at 2.30 and, you know, I'm asking, well, what is this? What is the Mercantile Exchange? Actually, he said he works at the Merc. Right. And so I wasn't tying Mercantile Exchange and Merc together, you know, at one point because I thought yeah, about it. Yeah, it could have been the drug company, Merc. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know any any of that, and so um, then I'm saying, well, what do they do down there? And he says, oh, they trade cattle, pork bellies, hogs, 
And then he says, I could get you a job down here. They need runners. And you know, I didn't know what a runner was. All I knew was he's asking me, you know, he could get me a job down there. And I knew that there were live animals. And I figured, you know, a runner's job was sweeping up everything. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I was cool. I was yeah. cool. So, you know, I, I made a comment. I said, you know, to myself, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I don't want to be around the smell. And, and, and <laughs> Oh, you home. took a field trip as a kid to Hawthorne Melody Farm. <laughs> That's kind of what I thought it was yeah, going to be. Yeah, uh, okay. And so, and he's, you know, I said, no, nah, I'll keep my normal job. And, you know, I kept it. And later on, you know, I had a roommate who was a floor manager for one of the clearing houses. And he was explaining to me short selling. And I'm arguing with him that you can't sell something you don't own. And this is going on for a while. And, uh, you know, maybe weeks later, I had an appointment downtown. And, you know, we agreed that, hey, we'll meet for lunch. And then he brought me on the trading floor. You know, I met him down there. And, and uh, he was welcome to the Merck. And I knew he worked at the Mercantile Exchange, and I'm thinking the Merc. This is where my buddy Fish and Nick works, and everyone works. And then I saw them on the trading floor because he brought me up there, and you know, I there were no animals, obviously. And oh yeah, uh, there were. They, they threw lots of elbows. Right. Only they were the human kind. Right. And and you know, then I saw it, and you know, he was explaining to me what's going on, and uh, it, it was pretty interesting to me and you know and then when I saw the parking lot and I saw the kind of cars that were in there at yeah. least on level one were a lot of the guys who had some really nice cars they like to park on level one they're all the big shots and um, I saw chauffeurs man drop people off in front oh yeah Very much mad if, uh, all, you know a lot of the clearing firm owners were pretty okay. rich yeah well and some of the border fillers too yeah uh, Harry Lawrence had a night a chauffeur. Harry, Harry the Hat. Yeah, I mean he uh, he always had a chauffeur. Belly Pit. His chauffeur got arrested once for drunk driving, so his chauffeur had a chauffeur to drive him around for a while. <laughs> well, he got his license back. <laughs> uh, I knew this'd be fun. All right, so you start. So you're a runner, okay? And, no, and a I lot never of people a runner. I I just I just. I just, you know, I had uh, kind of arguments at home with my wife and, you know, quit my job and, and, oh, yeah. and down on the trading floor. I knew, you know, I came down as my friend's clerk for about three months to observe. I just needed the clerk's badge. I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to just observe and learn how to trade. And so um, that's what I did. I was his clerk for three months doing nothing, just, you know, walk, walking around and watching people and trying to figure it out. And then finally, I, I just said to myself, um, the only way you're going to get this is to actually do it. So I, I have to come down here and I can't stand around for three months paper trading and, and, and think that I could do it. I have to actually do it. And so let me explain the term uh, pre-internet. Paper trading was, you know, you, you wrote down your trades and your stop and your target instead of having a demo account. So yes. uh, the, the worst thing that could happen uh, when you're paper trading, I used to say to people, was what happens when you're wrong? Do you get a paper cut? <laughs> well, that, that's pretty much it. What happens yeah. when you're wrong? See, the difference is on the trading floor, you got to make a decision. Am I going to get out or not? And you also, can I get out? Because the person I'm going to try to get out with might have just sold it to, you know, whatever he had to somebody else. And now I can't get out with that person. So you're not always able to get out. So what paper trading is, you know, basically, you know, you're writing down, oh, I got long Canadian dollar over here and I got out over here when it gets to that price. You know, it's easy to do that on paper and say, well, I would have gotten in here and I would have gotten out over here. But like I said, if, you know, in real life, those bids and offers may not be there because someone standing next to them grabbed them and you didn't get them. So, you know, paper trading doesn't always work. But, you know, it kind of gives you an idea if I if I look and say, here's where I would have gotten in at, you know, and, and you're honest. You know, that's a great segue to the modern era of demo accounts 
uh, Bob, I know that you teach and you mentor people. Um, do you tell them that, uh, you know, if they don't know how to take a demo account seriously, to at least like trade with micro lots for a long period of time so at least they get the feel for having skin in the game even though it's not a lot yes i want them to do that i i tell the people you know when we're when we're first of all when we're demo trading um do everything with market orders because when you do things with limit orders on a demo account your orders get filled a lot quicker um and so the reality isn't totally there um right. But if you do everything with a, a market order, say, okay, I'm going to get in here, and then you press buy at the market, give up the edge to get in, which, you know, many people on the trading floor, that's how they enter trades is market orders, and they're giving up an edge to get in. So, you know, if, if you do this and in, in, in simulate, you give up the edge to get in, and you're giving up the edge to get out, you're doing everything with market orders, that's about as real as it gets, you know, do these these simulated trades and do use limit orders they're, they're it's not real because you're getting filled a lot quicker and, and you might have been buying 10 contracts where in reality you might not have been able to even get one because you were staged in line in the correct order so um i always right. recommend market orders when we're when we're doing simulate and if we're successful trading with market orders we will be successful in, in real time yeah. Let me let me ask you about this, Bob. Uh, you know, being on the floor as a runner, I was working as a, a runner for Dean Witter, actually, you know, where you could go into their store and uh, set up an account in Sears and also set up a stock account with Dean Witter. But um, I noticed when I was there how interested the order fillers were on orders that had STP at the end of it. They okay. loved that. So did the okay. Yeah, yeah, stop. So uh, I also noticed that uh, when those orders were elected, um, there was kind of an audible roar, you know, that now algos do it, you don't hear anything except, you know, uh, your account changes. But uh, did you notice that too, that there were audible roars? And do you think that people say they knew a lot of these order fillers knew there were a block of buy stops above the market actually you know uh, were long into them and then use that liquidity to take profits and that's why there was usually um uh, fast markets happened in those conditions uh, where Absolutely. brokers weren't held uh what do you think do you think that there were stop hunts when human beings were doing this and do you think there still are stop hunts even there though is. it's HFT and and black boxes, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. See, what goes on is people think that, oh, this is a rigged game. They see the stops. They, they saw my stop. They ran right to my stop, stopped me out by one tick, and then the market went where I thought it was going to go, and it did it without me. This is a rigged game. It's not a rigged game. The thing is, they do see where the stops are, and they do go fishing for them. If you got deep pockets, you could fish for stops. And the reason why I say they don't physically see them, but they know where they're at, because when you're looking at a chart and you exactly. see you've got a trend go or you've got a zone there that's that's holding real nice support sitting there, you know that underneath that support, there's sell stops. So um, and right underneath them, a tick or two uh, above or below swing highs and lows. You know, people say, Dale, how do you know where the stops are? I said, well, why don't you look at a chart and imagine you're short? Where would you put your buy stop? That's and that, and I say, well, that's where everyone's is. It, that's exactly what it is. It's where everyone's is. Yours might be two or three ticks above that line. Mine might be four or five or six ticks above that line, but they're above that line. And, and and people go looking for them. Now, me as a local trader and, and many others, not just me, if I anticipate that, that there's stops over there, let's just say we're you know coming up into resistance and I think that there's a whole bunch of buy stops above that resistance, I may you know start loading up long and if the market's slow, and this is what will happen. If you could run the market up, I mean, sometimes I might have to buy 100 contracts to sell two or 300. Now, 
when I was on the trading floor, I wasn't a two or three hundred lot trader by any means. But I watched the, the banks do it. I watched bigger players do it. And, you know, they start loading up their position. And then, you know, when the market's kind of slow and it's trading up near there, they run it up. What's offered? They're looking for offers. You know, someone's offering 10 and 53. Buy 10 and 53. What else is offered? 54 I want. 55 I want. You know, and then they, yeah. they trigger off the stops. And, you know, if they think it's at 55, you know, 54 I want, 55 I want. Or maybe someone is, one local trader is offering a 57, which is off the market. But there's no better offers in front of that. I might say, buy one at 57, 207, you know, yeah, and, yeah, you're yeah. Seven, and you're triggering all the stops that are in between those. Yeah, yeah. have yeah. you also noticed that sometimes those are at least temporary turning points and some of them turn out to be important ones? Yes, some of them do, and and and, and that's when, when you mentioned before the, the the letters STP. I you know I want those orders because those are my. I mean that that's kind of bread and butter. If if I'm short and I know there's a bunch of stops there, and you could run it down there. Those are your outs. That's your out right. on the trade. So so now algos run it for liquidity, to get out of the trade. That's yeah. the difference. Instead of it being, you know, Harry the Hat and all the guys in the cattle pat, uh, uh, pit doing it or the belly pit, it's now black boxes and algos. So, you know, um, I remember, I have a pretty good memory. The, the people I work with are amazed how I remember their trades and things that they say. And, and you know what I remember from our interview, Bob, is that you do something that pros do that most uh, amateurs can't do. And maybe we could see your trading setup. But I remember interviewing you and you talked about like when you have a trend, you will press the advantage. Uh, you'll buy more as it proves another uh, level being taken out and then add more and you're trailing your stop all the way. So why don't you, why don't you talk to us a little bit about how you <clears throat> came to that type of methodology, because uh, most people, they're if they're long and they get a nice pop, they're booking it, whereas you might be building the position it, it, uh, instead of getting out. So uh, tell us a little bit about that. And am I correct? That is still your trading style, and that must have been three years ago. Yes, no, it's still my trading style. And okay. Is is see, I've watched a variety of different traders on that trading floor. I, I was fortunate to be down there when the superstars that we read about um, were still walking around the trading floor. Yeah, they had order fillers that filled stuff for them, but a lot of them were still doing it themselves. And, you know, I was able to watch them do their thing. Now, it's not like you could walk up to them and, and ask them, well, what are you thinking about right now as you're doing that trade? What do you do? <laughs> I can't really go up to them and ask them that. But of the ones that I was friendlier with, that I got to be friendly with, yeah, you could ask them questions like that. But, you yeah. know, you're watching these guys do certain things over and over again. You don't have to ask them. When you see the same guys doing pretty much the same thing over and, you know, like, for instance, with me, I would buy something, buy or sell something. I couldn't wait to get out of it. I wanted to ring the cash register and, and, and you know, and rack up some money, you know. So I buy something. I was so quick to get out of these trades, you know. And then I would watch, you know, other guys come in and they, you know, buy 20, I'll buy 20, I'll buy 20, I'll buy 20. It was long 80 contracts and walks away. And, and it, you don't see him coming to the pit until later on in the day and he's selling 80 contracts. And the market's 60, 70 ticks higher. And then you count up, you know, wow, those must be the 80 he bought earlier because I sold him a couple. And, and, and then you're thinking, how much could he have made on that? And then you see, wow, he made about 72 ticks and 80 contracts. And, you know, you're just like drooling. And, you know, and I would see that over and over. And one thing that I observed is these guys weren't getting out at certain targets that, you know, I might have had a target. This is where I have to get out at. They weren't getting out at certain targets. They were watching it go through those targets if they went through. And then they would buy more. 
Now, as it gets to the targets, they're tightening up their stop a little bit just in case that target does hold and the market turns around. But I've watched these guys do what I call pressing up adding more to their position, adding more and adding more. One of the things that I teach in class and that everybody teaches in these classes, never add to a losing trade because it'll it'll bury you. Keep adding to losers, your, your money will run out real quick and you won't be there. I mean, I've watched many guys on the trading floor bust out doing exactly just that. So, you know, if you don't add to losers and you never add to losers, but you do the opposite of what, you know, because I've watched these guys do it. They add to the winners. They don't get out and say when we get when it gets to a certain level and say, OK, this is all the money I want to make on this trade. I only can need you, to make seven. You add, uh, like, say, for example, you're long five and you get through another area. Do you add the same quantity or less because the market's going up? That, that's a good question. I personally, I have a 50 percent rule because 50% corrections are fairly common in the market. So if, if, if it makes a nice little run today, you know, for it to pull back 50%, it's not a big deal. And so if I'm, and I talk about in class, I says, you know, greed is good. I use Gordon Gecko's yeah. word, movie Wall Street. Greed right. is good. And but then I throw in, greed is good, but being a pig is not. And there's a fine line between greed and pig. All right. So now going back to your question, uh, how do you add on? If I'm long five contracts and now we run to a level and it's time for me to press up, add some more on. If I add five more on or, you know, and we have the money in our account, maybe I add 10 more on because I'm really getting greedy. That's one of the fine lines between greed and pig. Because we're trading a highly leveraged product where, you know what, it doesn't have to move a ton and you could still make some good money. Uh, so if, if I have five on and then we get to another level and I buy five more, we get that 50% pullback, I'm at break even. We get a 51% pullback, I'm losing money. And it's hard to stay with those trades. It's hard for me to ride that, that winner when, you know, I'm all of a sudden at break even in a, in a short period of time. And then, you know, one more tick, I'm losing money. So it's hard to stay with those trades. But if I'm long five contracts and now we're starting to go through one of my levels and I buy my 50% rule, two and a half or less I could buy. Since I'm long five, I go with 50% of my okay. position that I've, here, that I've got sitting on the books. So I could buy two and a half or less. And since I can't buy a half, it's going to be two. So I'm long five. I buy two more. If I get that 50% correction, I still got profit on the trade. Even with a 61% correction, I've got profit. Not as much as I'd like, but I, I still have profit. So, so you're building a pyramid instead of an inverted one if you had bought exactly. 10. And in class, I call it a Christmas tree. I okay. see it like a Christmas tree. You know, you want the bulk of your position if you're long. You want the bulk of your position beneath you, and then you scale in. You put on a few more and a few more, and this way you're not what I call top-heavy because you start getting top-heavy. If you put all the decorations on your Christmas tree and you start from the top down, and you got the bulk of the ornaments and lights and everything on the very top, and as you're coming down to the bottom, you're, 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 it's getting very sparse because, you know, you're a little too drunk when you started setting the tree up. <laughs> You work from the top down, um, that tree is going to be top heavy and it's going to topple over. And, and that's what happens to your trade if you if you let it become top heavy. I mean, you might have a million dollars, two million in your account, and you're watching it go up and you buy 10 and then you buy 15 more and then you buy 20 more. You're inverted. Your, your Christmas tree is inverted and you're, all your weight is above you and it'll be real easy to give all that money back and more. And that too, I've watched it happen firsthand and you being on the trading floor, you've seen it firsthand. That money goes away real quick. I Let mean, alone a bad outro. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to ask you if you ever noticed this, you know, some guys on the floor had very strong uh, reps. They were almost, you know, legends walking onto the floor. And uh, did have you ever seen a guy 
who comes into the pit and because he does something, everyone goes with him. And what they really did was say, for example, they got very long upstairs, right? Uh -huh. And the market's uh, going up and they come they come into the pit and they just buy a little and all the co-tailers come in and they were just looking for a way out. Well, and, they, whenever, and, and people didn't know they were already long from, you know, hours ago. Right. They're pushing their position. And there's so many people that, that coattail these guys. You know, Richard Dennis was a big, you know, yeah. uh, everyone liked to coattail his orders. And, you know, if he wasn't physically doing the order himself, he'd have one of his orders. Jack Callahan or Jack's brother, you know, uh, um, would do it, Jerry. So Water. you really didn't know if they were establishing a position or just coming down to liquidate uh, based upon what they did uh, away from the floor. That right. was a pretty cool trick, wasn't it? You never really knew what they're doing. You didn't know if they were covering or getting in. Unless yeah. you know, you're standing there all day long and you see those orders coming in in the morning and then a few more buys come in in the afternoon, you know he's getting long. And so, um, or you assume they are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a great trick. I mean, you know, that's uh, the power of personality. Uh, you know, I know you've been teaching and mentoring for a long time, Bob. Uh, if you could break down one sentence, like I asked Jack Schwager this, uh, what's the most important thing you could uh, advise traders? And he said, find a trading style that suits your personality. What would be a Robert Dunnism that uh, you talk about every time you run a class? That's probably uh, the most important theme or narrative that you teach. Well, the most important thing I teach, and, and it'll be pretty pretty clear to everyone else out there listening, you know, and, and risk management in this business is clearly the key. When we're trading a leveraged product, we cannot let, you know, markets go against us too much because we need dollars in order to make more dollars. Those are our tools. We start running out of those tools. We can't make dollars. So risk management is the Number one, you know, rule that I, I teach and, you know, you would think everybody would know that, but they don't really know that. And they uh, hear it, but they don't practice they, it. They hear it, but they don't practice it because when you have money on the line, all of a sudden you become emotional and you do what I call you're getting married to the trade. You start to marry it because... Yeah. You know, you got money involved and you got long for a reason. So now you're going to talk yourself into every reason why that long trade is good. And we can't marry any of our trades. So Better to date them, Bob, you know, for a few for a few days? That's what I talk about. We date okay. people. We don't marry them. And, you know, and, and you know what? Sometimes the women think I'm a pig when I'm talking, you know. Like, <laughs> but, well, but I put humor on it because yeah. I let I go, hey, come on, you guys do the same thing. You dump us the second, you know, you don't like one of our little habits and you dump us. So, you know, but they get Yeah, it. especially if they dump us if we don't <laughs> practice yeah. good risk management. Exactly. Exactly. All right. <laughs> so, so, but, you know, they get it. And, and the thing is, you know, risk management is so key because I've seen – First of all, nine out of ten people do not make it on that trading floor. And I've been down on that floor since 1980. So the common thread that I've seen amongst the losers that are here today and gone tomorrow, the common thread is all risk management. Most of these guys that blow out, they average into losers. They don't use stops. You know, they let the losers go too long. I mean, that was the common thread that I saw amongst everything. Okay, and then, Bob. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, I, your Twitter handle is Trader Goalie One because you know how to play defense, right? No, uh, I am a, go a hockey goalie. Okay. Uh, uh, any other ways that people that are listening right now or tune into the video later uh, can reach you or get a hold of you? I recommend you follow Robert at that Twitter handle at Trader Goalie One, and that's spelled out, isn't it? O N E. Out. Trader goalie one all spelled out, and okay. uh, I could be reached on there. Um, uh, I post the S and P tweets, you know, uh, 
upside market and a downside market every day. Once in a while, I'm a little late getting them out because I'm either on an airplane or I'm out to dinner and I just, you know, don't get home to do it. But I get them done. And occasionally I'll quote out the currencies if I see a layup type trade that looks like, you know, an easy shot. I'll, I'll throw that out there and put it out there. Oh, talking about layups, how, how are the Bulls doing this year? You know what? They're not doing that good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. I'm not surprised. And I'm sure you were heartbroken. What a great season for the Bears this year. And I, then, uh, huh? I was definitely heartbroken for that. They yeah. got rid of the kicker, you know. But yeah. what a great season. I mean, it's the most excitement. Uh, you know, I'm still a Bear fan, even though I don't live there and I'm in California. But uh, I tell you, what a great season. Terrific. And you know what? What a great interview to bring the color of uh, the, you know, what used to be into the present moment for traders. Uh, that, you know, it kind of says nothing really changes, even though there are robots instead of people trading, it's trading. And thank you so much for edifying the face community today, Robert, my Chicago trading war, your brother. Uh, may pips rain down on you throughout 2019. Hope it's a great year for you and everyone you teach. I hope you have a great year. I mean, uh, we should all have a great year. And, uh, you know, and the, the main thing to, that, again, that I could tell everybody out there, we, we talked about risk management, it's following those rules. I have very simple rules in my classes, and one of them is, you know, never break the rules. And, 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 and you know, what, what is one of the rules? Always use a stop and know what your loss is going to be on every trade. Yeah, no, no mental stops, because the last time I used a mental stop, my first stop was a mental institution. <laughs> so, so well, yeah. Bob, it was the, great. It was great chatting with you, buddy. Thank you. Same here. I love it. We'll do it again. Okay, that's a promise. So, everyone, Robert Dunn, thank Robert, and uh, we, you've got a little bit of market history here that still applies in the modern age. And uh, yeah, again, you could follow Robert at Trader Goalie One on Twitter. And that's a wrap for Turnaround Tuesday, everyone. Remember, don't just count your pips; count your blessings. And we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thanks again, buddy. It was a Thank great you. interview. Talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, adios.